Mary Beth Thiel. I'm the board president. I have lots of kids. Several of them, three of them, are disabled. Two of them are consumers. And I really enjoy this position because I am learning so much and hopefully helping a little bit. <coughs> Um, I'm Lena Lars Smith. I am a board member. Okay, they want me to tell you more about myself. All right, I have two severely mentally handicapped sons who are part of the Regional Center. I am a formal special education teacher. I hold a master's in special ed and I have worked with special ed people, young and old, for about 29 years. Okay. Um, Jennifer Baca, I'm the new board secretary. Um, I have a master's in disability policy. I'm Christina Benjamin. I am newly appointed vice president. Family members <clears throat> that have uh, disabilities and have two children. <laughs> and I work in uh, media. Uh, media is special. I work with the media. <laughs> King. I have uh, two grandchildren who are regional center consumers. <clears throat> I'm the treasurer and chairman of the business committee. I'm Tom Josand. I'm a parent of a client. I'm, a board I'm Drew Kevler. I'm a physician at uh, Loma Linda Children's Hospital. I'm uh, Peter Aston. I live in Rancho Mirage and I have an adult son with Down syndrome. And, uh, uh, yeah, years ago I was also on the board of the uh, Foundation for the Retarded of the Desert, now known as Desert Art. I am Tammy Simpson, and I am the new chair of the VAC Committee, the Vendor Advisory Committee. Uh, my name is Jack Padilla. I'm part of the Business Committee. Uh, I live in Beaumont, and I'm a parent of two children. Two babies. <laughs> I'm Candy Sissel. I have um, two adult clients at the regional center. And um, in my prior life, I was a neonatal intensive care nurse. <laughs> uh, my name is Denise Wolsey. I have a almost 27 year old son with autism who is a consumer of the regional center. And I'm also the Quality Enhancement Committee Chair. And I'm Carol Fitzgibbons, and I'm the Director for the Regional Center. Yeah, let's not forget Christian. Oh, Christian. We all introduced ourselves. My name ain't... <clears throat> My name ain't Casey Pike. I work from... I work at AOC School of San Mondino. And, uh... But, uh... In the Empire Week, you know, Tim. Welcome, everyone. Madam Secretary, a quorum has been there. The first item of business is the minutes of the July 8th board meeting. <laughs> is everyone able to review these minutes? Do we have a motion to accept Aye. the minutes? Aye. Okay. okay. Now, Christian, you have to say, I move. We I move it. We accept the minutes. Accept a minute. Of the July 8th meeting. I'm July 8th meeting. Thank you, Christian. And our second is leave. Yes. Topic is now open for discussion. Is there any discussion? Amanda. Mm -hmm. No. Patrick. I wasn't here, but on the last page, page 7, item 3, the motion made to accept the office of the representatives of what? 
are just pulled out. So if, if you go back to item three. Is that Christine Pouchet? <coughs> item three, board or member evaluation that, task force. Or is that the appointment of committee members? Or is that the sample letter? You just have to go to the third motion. That'd be one, two, three. That was the master trust. I wasn't here, so I don't... I know, but when you... Okay, if you look at the... We just added the motions out at the back side. So maybe next time when we add out the motions, we'll put what item they are, okay? And that'll be easier to count back. If you just go back and look at the motion, 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 you can see it's the third motion. The reason I, I like the motions listed in the on the last page... Oh, it's a good idea. I'm not questioning that. Okay, so that, that gives us a motion book. So that if you keep all of your minutes, you can quickly find the motion, mm -hmm. any motions that were made, so that we follow the motions. They have to read through every single page to find the proper motion is a little bit difficult. So it's a work in progress. At the end, we'll just put what subject matter it was, and it'll be easier for you to pluck them out. Okay? Any other comments, questions on the minutes? I have a question on Dennis's last name. Is it Plymate or Male? Which one you want, Dennis? <laughs> Are you the male or the mate? <laughs> Dennis? Denise is asking. What's your last name? Plymale. It's like Plywood, except Plymale. Well, no, let's not have a third name here. Plymale, Plymate, okay. Plymate or Plywood. I thought it was a. <laughs> we'll take Plymale. Plymale. Okay. 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 That's it now. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, I, I noticed here that these motions are underlined in bold. And I think if you go through it, you'll see that there's seven of them, and they're listed in that order again. Yes. I don't know, for those of us who are fans, maybe you want to number the motions? Yes. The yeah, we'll, motion, we'll number them uh, at the back, at the end of the motion, to tell you exactly which subject <coughs> matter it's with. Okay? okay? Yeah. That's we'll a nice addition to the <coughs> Okay. Any other questions on the minutes? No, she just thought his name was Climate. Wanted to rename him. So, no, his name is right. He, he chose that name. Denise, any questions? I was wondering if we got back to Mo Mendoza about whatever she uh, she that says in here that she asked to have something put on her agenda for the next meeting. But I know she put a lot of input last time as to what she wanted. Uh, she did give mm -hmm. us a, a, a list of different kinds of information that she wanted to have mm -hmm. in regards to the Landerman um, Developmental Center closure. And we are in the process of collecting <coughs> Because there was quite a bit um, that she was requesting. Right. I just didn't know. We'll have that ready. Okay. Actually, for the full board. Okay. You can hear that report. Okay. Anything? Are, are you just taking questions on the minute? I have one question on the minute. All right. I'm taking questions. Okay. Uh, on page two, I guess it's the same person. Page two. About uh, ask about the board, the public getting the same packet the board gets. We've taken care of that. So they got all of this stuff? We have two copies out front okay. on the front desk, and the board packet is on the website. So yes, that was taken care of. I saw the board packet. I actually went to the real one because you know my printer went work, but I messed with it because Jennifer gave me one. But we do have them available on the website, and there'll be two at the front desk if you need to go out and take a look at it. Anything else? Do I? Uh, Everyone else finished? I'm going to call no. for the proposal. One quick one. One quick um, one. The filming of the board meeting, I know that the motion was um, made and carried, uh, or seconded and carried, but um, I know Mr. Nagar had asked um, for Carol, or Carol was looking to the funding and report back.
contact within 30 days, but the minutes doesn't reflect that that we should. All right, can we change the minutes to reflect that, please? That we would come back with a report. And since we're at the 30 days, I'm sure we can get this report. Okay, we'll do that in your report. Okay, I am calling for the vote. All those in favor of accepting the minutes with changes and questions answered? Aye. 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 Opposed? Do you oppose? No, I abstain. I, wasn't I haven't got to abstention yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> Abstention? Yes. One abstention. Motion carries. All right, now our public input. <laughs> Yes, public input is uh, five minutes. I have a timer. I will start this timer for five minutes after you give your introduction and salutations to the group. So I won't time you for that, but at the end of the five minutes, the timer will go off. And see you later. Bye bye. <laughs> if you aren't able to finish your full statement, the board is interested in your full statement. There are clipboards over at the front desk by Sandra. You may pick up a clipboard, finish writing out uh, whatever else you have to say. It will be copied and given back to the entire board. So please respect the five minutes because look at this. This could be all night. <coughs> but we do want to hear what you have to say. <coughs> Just feel free to pick up the clipboard. Madam President. Yes. I am not saying anything about the recording, but I have a safety concern that the cord runs in front of the podium where people are going to be walking up to. I Everybody go behind the podium. Well, they have to miss they the cord. They have to miss the cord. It has to be the on the side. It's on the back side. Oh, is it? Right. Yeah. yeah. So it, can you run that without that while the public is speaking? Yeah. Okay. I, I, I think the battery is okay. Sure. We just don't want anybody tripping. Right. Tripping on that thing with the podium. Okay. <laughs> First person up. Barry Solomon, do you want to come up to now, Barry? Yeah, I, I'd just like to reserve uh, very bad the opportunity to discuss something after the 6 4 comes out. All right, we'll put you there. It might not be necessary. All right, I'll put you there. You. Tina Miners? <coughs> okay, Tina Miners. <coughs> Remembers? I have Miners. Oh, I would I like mind. to reserve my Tina, spot you. until after <coughs> the guy comes up to. Okay. All right, I'll put you with Barry. Yep. All right. Greg Davewood. Wildwood. Game Wood. Oh, excuse me, I am going to ruin every name and I apologize. Sorry. <laughs> right. I did know Dennis. That's all right. Good evening. How are you all tonight? Appreciate your time. Mm -hmm. uh, Put this together a few minutes this afternoon. Have been here for a while. You all look great. Sounds like things have been going well. I've been uh, administrating homes for the intermediate care facilities. It's been an experience. Just a few ideas. I know you guys are very intelligent and can get the job done, but from some of the stuff I've heard and read, I thought maybe some of the ideas I have might be of interest to you. The facility housings with four to six uh, beds uh, provide a private room. Uh, the issue at hand is a person in a facility needing their own room. Some IRC clients will live at a facility for their entire life since the compensation at the levels 4I and ICF for about $5,000 a month. The opportunity for a single room should be offered. Any facility being offered over a certain amount of compensation should easily generate a room for a single occupant. This is not to say that a facility should not uh, have six bedrooms within license. The ratio for staff to a resident is generally one staff to three residents and should be the minimum. The IRC, fire department, and other agencies should determine what is the minimum acceptable for a bedroom as to square feet and windows. In round number of six clients times 5,000 is $30,000 a month, times 10 houses if 10 houses did exist in the group is $300,000 a month. What percent of these funds are spent on the direct care of the residents? IRC needs to share its policy. The healthcare industry must show spending 80% directly in providing health services. Surely with the above uh, numbers, 60000 a month would be enough profit for administration under a government program. So knowing what the uh, profit ratio is would be appreciated. 
The issues of concern for a single room are privacy, safety, and health. Privacy to dress and undress without view of another, to have conversations with others in one's own room, to store no one's possessions are not touched or taken, to have personal notes and space to call your own, as already outlined in consumer rights. Personal preference is just easier when you have your own room. Safety and issues of uh, not want, wanting to have your roommate touch you, avoiding confrontation with the roommate. Health, if the roommate is contagious as to disease, MERS, or other infections, there's more potential for harm. Any roommate having general disruptive behaviors can wear down the other in the room. One method used now in place is a, to place a deaf person in the same bedroom with another that screams or snores or can't sleep. Viewing your roommate's behavior, you do not want to see a uh, light self-injury, screams and so on and snores, can cause personal distress. At the community care levels, another room could be generated by having nocturnal staff thereby opening up another room as one staff at night will not uh, be a high cost. Generally, CCF staff have sl sleep shift now in their own bedroom. Staff could leave the facility for hours due to a knock for their overnight break. Facilities are needed, but for those that could live in a group support or able to live with advocates, this should be their priority. Just like the Lanterman issues, new ideas are needed. On the financial, the budget shows a projected cost of $763,000 for the next fiscal year, while consulting services will be $91,000. An ad hoc committee needs to be organized for lawsuits and to figure out how to reduce litigation so funds may go for services to the clients of IRC. As to cost needing an MSW or a nurse to visit for monthly notes or ISPs, I feel that's not needed. Community care representatives are needed, so social workers at the MSW level can counsel and help provide person-centered planning. We need to identify and eliminate duplication of services. Some facilities need referrals and counseling. Some families need referrals and counseling for issues such as depression and PTSD, making for better consumer lives. Self-determination bill S468. This concept has been in effect before, resulting in one client, a regional center in the state, using it. An outline of the old process and comparing it to the proposal of law and the differences, along with costs and benefits, would be appreciated. The videos of the meeting, I was suggesting that anyone should continue to be able to record meetings. The free recording service is needed. The local TV, cable companies, or colleges may be able to assist. IRC has its own audio video team. The city of Merino Valley incidentally has the cable company go out and, and record for them. Um, as for safety, alarming leaving facilities, some may not know, but facilities, even with extremely challenged residents, it's against the rules to alarm a door by hanging a bell on it or using other electronic device. In the common home, usually one will announce they are leaving due to courtesy, scheduling, and safety. Over the last few years, several have died leaving their facility and walking into traffic. A review for certain hours or some other means needs to be done to assist this population. Just like we license drivers, we may need to look at a person's abilities for leaving a facility alone regarding safety. Transparency of all facilities' performance would assist in this too regarding injury, elopement rate, and similar in, in issues. Volunteers are needed that would call and or visit residents of facilities that would like an outside contact. I've seen this work, and it's a real benefit to all involved. It's the special needs trust. I'll post this at the back. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Could you give a copy of that to Sandra, please? Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Andrea Neptune. <laughs> <laughs> this is where that problem is. <laughs> um, hi, I want to thank Carol. I talked to her last week and I'm a woman of my word when I say I'm going to come and speak to everyone, so here I am. But I do appreciate Carol because she did rectify my problem rather, rather quickly. But I did want to make sure uh, to make the, the Board of Trustees aware. Um, I'm a parent of two children with autism who has an out-of-state insurance provider. And my ABA services were terminated because um, I'm an out-of-state provider that doesn't provide services. It's not part of our benefit plan. So I had letters of denial, but Regional Center went ahead and cut my services. So um, in the appeal process, I sent the appeal letters to, to IRC, and they still said no. But one of the things that you all should know is that, you know, my case manager mandated that I file a, a Department of Managed Health Care complaint 
um, against my insurance company, which I thought was really cruddy <laughs> because I didn't feel comfortable doing that. A, the Department of Managed Healthcare for the state of California has zero jurisdiction over, <laughs> over what happens in another state. My state happens to be in Illinois. So I thought that that was kind of cruddy that they mandated that. And, and I continually told her, they have no jurisdiction, it doesn't do any good. And she said, oh no, you, without that form, we can't reinstate your children's services. So it was kind of cruddy. And the thing is, is even if they did, I wouldn't want to file a complaint against my insurance company because I like them. They pay for my speech, my occupational therapy, my physical therapy, and hippotherapy for my kids. And if you know how hard it is to get hippotherapy paid for, my insurance company does. So I didn't want to file a complaint, but I did do the appeal process. And, and meet the needs. And, and when I finally got to, to Carol, she was great about rectifying the situation. I understood that I, I can't control the verbiage in my insurance company's letters of denial, <laughs> but that I, I kind of wanted to come and speak to all of you so that you understood that there are a few of us out there that are fighting this battle without a state insurance and that it's not, it's not easy and, <laughs> and that we're doing what we can and Good. the funding still comes back to all of you and making the process easier would certainly help us because the, the time I spent on the phone over the last week in trying to do that takes away from the care and services that I need to provide for my children. Um, so that was that was basically it, and, and I, I did want to ask, and I, and I sent this a note to my uh, case manager. I haven't received any information from her, by the way, Carol, but I did ask for the information about the legislation that allows uh, IRC to terminate their services um, with having the denial letters from my insurance company in hand. So she still Deny, you know, terminated my services. By the way, did not tell my provider that they were terminated. <laughs> uh, so we we had a problem with the, the provider provided services past the date that they got cut off because neither of us knew that they actually did terminate. Um, but anyway, uh, she had the letters of denial from my insurance company and still went ahead and terminated. And for a self-injurious child with autism, not having the regimen of his ABA was a huge deal. So I just, you know, when I, when I finally did get to Carol and she heard my plea, she did rectify the problem, but know that um, it took a lot of work for me to do that and for other parents that may not be as, as boisterous or committed to their kids, they would have, um, or just decide to forget it and not fight the fight, but I will fight on. So that's pretty much it. I just wanted to inform you about that. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to excuse myself a moment and pass. Um, I have special needs children too. <laughs> Ashley Lopez. Hi, my name is Ashley Lopez. My son is nine and he's been a client since he was two. He has autism. And I've been coming for a little while and just thought I would speak up that I would really appreciate the committee meetings being open to the public. It's nerve-wracking as a parent not to be able to have the information and wondering why they're closed. And would just like to be able to have that information and be able to attend if I chose. Thank you. Good evening, board members. First, I want to say thank you very much for um, listening to the last meeting that several of us that came up and discussed wanting to have the full agenda with all the items. Really appreciate that, following up with that and following through and making it happen. And I was going to thank uh, Mary Beth for following up with me on providing the letters of support and opposition to two pieces of legislation. Mm. So you guys can tell her <laughs> later. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to reiterate my requ my request and several parents' requests to make the standing committee mm. meetings that are written in the bylaws of the IRC bylaws to be open to the public. Currently they are closed. Um, uh, so, so that the public can attend and, and make their requests known um, at the committee meetings at that, that level. And I I didn't know if um, SB 468 it was, it's under old business if there's going to be action taken because it says info slash, act, slash action. So if it's just an information um, item, then I don't have very much to say. But if, <laughs> but if it is an action item, then 
just wanted to voice my support for it. Thank you very much. Good evening, board members. My name is Maria Arias. I, too, I am the parent of a special child. She's a Down syndrome child. She's nine years old. This is my first time coming up here. But I, too, want to request that the board meetings are open to the public. As a parent, I need to be informed of everything that, has, that will deal with my child. She, is, uh, she, certain, she obtains services through Inland Regional Center as well as uh, the school district. I go to every school district because I need to be informed as well with the education portion. So I would like to request that the board meetings are also open to the public. As parents, we have a say what goes on into our child's lives as well as our health. We have to look, we are their eyes, their mouths. We have to speak for them at times. And therefore, we need to listen also. The laws, the changes, the regulations, because everything affects them and in turn affects our families and their siblings, of course. And I too want to have a say on uh, SB 468. I too um, endorse it because I want to have a say who's going to deal with my child, what uh, vendor or what entity, because not all of them will help my child. They're all different. And therefore, I want to have a say where she can go and who she can see. I'm out looking for the best of my child, uh, both in education, health, and services. So I, too, would like to ask the board members to, to, continue, uh, to continue to understand how important this is for all the parents that have special needs, child, special needs children. I have a three-year-old that may have a delay. I'm in the process of uh, getting or seeking psychological um, evaluations. So I know this is very well my road what I'll be going for the next 20, 30 years. So I will like all the information to be open to, to the parents. Thank you for your time. Barry Solomon. Um, am I on there twice? No, we just got to the end there. Oh. My name is Brian Entz, and I have a level two operated uh, facility in the high desert, uh, owner operated facility for about the last 20 years. And I wanted to speak to you a moment about the policy that has it's been explained to me recently uh, of, of not placing clients in four to six bed facilities or five to six bed facilities while there were uh, some facilities, four bed facilities that were having difficulty filling their beds. Uh, we recently were able to tour, uh, provide a tour for a client who showed a clear interest in our facility. Uh, the family definitely had a preference for our facility. And we were very excited also about this placement because we thought they'd be perfect with our facility. And then that placement was canceled on account of that policy. It just seems to me that that is putting things backwards. It is putting the interest and the needs of the smaller facilities ahead of the choices of the consumers. Now, in each instance, as long as the regional center is satisfied that the placement is appropriate, it should only be uh, a choice matter for the consumer, so long as the care provider is agreeable to it. But we would never expect uh, the, the regional center to run preference for us or to in any way try to help us to meet our quota, and we wouldn't expect the same for others. Basically, that's all I have wanted to say. Thank you very much. Okay, very solemn.
Good evening. In response to the gentleman's comments, um, there was a letter sent. Uh, most of us got it in our package. I'd like to read a paragraph. And this is in his letter. Recently, we had the placement of a new consumer to our facility, scheduled and approved, but then canceled due to this policy. Carol, if I'm correct, this is not the policy. There never was the policy that a consumer who wants to go to a facility that's a six bed, uh, vendorized for six, licensed for six, is pulled out because IRC is not respecting six beds. And it seems to me that the implementation of that with some of the staff was totally incorrect. Our, our discussions have always been consumer oriented, consumer's decision, licensed for six, vendorized for six. So I'm just curious, is, was that a misunderstanding in the, in the implementation of that policy? I, I think so, Barry. Um, um, we have, have not instructed the family to go out. If the person is already living there and it is the and they've been there for a while, we do not tell them to, to leave. No, but it seems that there was a bed available, if I'm correct in a six-bed facility, everything was approved, and then the client, they said, oh, well, sorry, you can't, because we're working towards a four-bed policy. Well, we'll have to look into the time Okay, I, it just seems to me that that was a misrepresentation, and that really is not the implementation of a policy, and kind of the spirit that we've been moving through over the last while. That's true. Okay. I'm reserving for Okay, we will go further now. <coughs> board Smith and Harry Board 12. 13, I'm sorry. I always not, I, I never like to. Harry Board 12, although I'd rather be 13, I think, at this point. Well, <laughs> it's San Diego. <laughs> it's not because of the inland. It's so not. Like, well, I don't know. We'll think about it. Um, remember, I have current too, so it's, yeah. Well, uh, first I wanted to start off by saying uh, kudos and thank you to a couple of people at the Regional Center who have uh, really helped us make a difference in resolving some cases, mutual cases that we both serve. Uh, primarily the clinical team. I don't know if you guys have ever met your clinical team, but your clinical team just rocks, uh, for lack of a better term. Uh, Valerie Mosher, Annette uh, Richardson, uh, Michelle Knighton, and Renee Zambell especially uh, for helping on some very uh, serious cases where there were some clients' rights issues involved and just trying to help get those resolved. So, And of course, uh, Wasima for helping to put together a meeting recently with Redlands Dental where we kind of um, realized there was a lot of miscommunication between uh, providers of residential services and uh, them providing dental services. And of course, Lavinia who guides and leads all of them. I also want to thank Trevin and Carol for coming to our board meeting uh, last Saturday, and especially for Vince Toms, who came and spent some time uh, with uh, his peer at uh, Riverside County Mental Health, helping my board become more aware of where mutual responsibilities between Inland Regional Center and both counties of mental health come into play when a client is mutually served by both. Um, it's something that if you as a board haven't uh, become familiar with, you may want to familiarize yourself with as to... Um, in the system of agencies, there's always a lot of buck passing, but sometimes things can really work together for the good and making sure the client gets what they need when they're in two very difficult systems to provide services. Uh, so I want to thank Vince for coming and doing that too. Uh, this Saturday, we're redoing our Riverside uh, Housing Conference, uh, for lack of better terms. The last one was deplorable, so we asked the uh, provider to do it again. So uh, if you're interested and you didn't make it last time, uh, and, and this, uh, I was going to reserve my comment for the four to six thing, but really I'm not sure if I'm going to stick around, so I'll just uh, say it now. Um, I really always encourage this regional center to look at the least restrictive setting, and part of that I think is that over the last couple of years, we seem to have kind of dipped into a lull of not really getting our clients out, purchasing their own homes, uh, partnering up with other clients to, to jointly purchase a home. Um, and do those kinds of novel kinds of development for different kinds of residential. And while we always have boarding cares, we'll always have a need for that kind of level of service. 
However, this regional center was always very progressive and moving towards more normalized environments. And so it was always very encouraging to see things where people had their own rooms. And it's great if you can have an eight bedroom house and everybody still has their own room. However, that's not typically the case when you're looking at licensed facilities, whether they be ICF, SNFs, or community care facilities. So I'd like to see uh, the regional center push a little bit more for doing that. I also noticed that in the uh, draft report on the four to six, um, that the committee was made up solely of no consumers. <laughs> um, and so because your performance contract ties you um, to that priority area, it might be something to encourage you to do a public forum to get input on this issue where you're going to the, uh, the consumer advisory committee or other consumer-led groups and kind of get what they would like to see you do in future development, which is kind of separate and apart really from this issue because the reality is we all know the arm rate's deplorable. It was developed based on a very, very old model, it needs to be redone, but what can we do in the meantime to push the progression of the types of residential developments um, where Inland always kind of took things into the future. Um, <clears throat> Get Safe is also, uh, by the way, uh, hosting and trying to build a couple more self-advocacy groups for us in this area, so we'll be doing um, some recalls of people who came to the big self-advocacy conference in 2012 and notifying them that they're going to have these other uh, day meetings, and so if your uh, loved one or one that you don't like so much right now uh, gets one of those uh, messages in the mail and they want to come or you want more information, just email me and I'll do that. And finally, I do want to let you know that we are in the process of reviewing your SLS guidelines and policies. It was based on a, uh, a series of complaints that were voiced by consumers. And then we met with uh, approximately nine of your SLS providers, which is a pretty good chunk, um, all of which who shared uh, some very concerning uh, issues for us. Carol is aware of them. We've been talking about them. I also shared them at our board meeting as well. I can t let you know just in the very precursory review of your policies, uh, we were sent the wrong ones first, then we were sent the right ones, so uh, double review, um, that any time that something has in uh, hard writing a time limit to it on any type of service, it causes a red flag um, because there is nothing in the Lanterman Act that has a natural time limit on it, so it's all driven by that IPP, so it is one of the, the first items that uh, we looked at in the SLS policy that you have as a board says that you'll fund SLS for six months. Um, so it's one of those things that I think probably the change of terminology or just kind of working that out and we've been more than happy to sit down with you and try to work that out to get to some kind of uh, meaningful resolution. Um, so that's all I have. Although I can report that Jack, your conflict of interest is up again in our executive committee meeting tomorrow. I can't promise you anything because from what I'm being told, uh, they don't want to review the process. Um, so. Uh, that's all I know on that one, but it is a, uh, for executive committee at state council tomorrow. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> the executive committee report. No. Well, on our executive committee, we um. <laughs> I'll take that back. <laughs> we had staff present and we went over some of the items that are on the agenda, so we will be touching those later. Um, we made a motion to accept um, a report and it was going to pull forward, and it will be also discussed later. We had we, were, we discussed before six bed, which is also on your um, agenda. So pretty much everything was agenda driven. So the executive committee met and we went over all the things that are, we are now going to be speaking on later. So it was, you'll be hearing every single thing. I really don't think that's going to repeat it because we placed everything pretty much on the agenda. So we shall go forward. Executive Director's Report. Um, and so what I need to talk with you all about, I think it's easier if we, if we are face to face. <laughs> I have just a couple of, of fast little things um, that I wanted to discuss with you. And then um, I also want to bring you up to date on the performance contract and we'll be showing a video on that. Um, 
Today we have just a little over 28,000 clients, which is wonderful. Um, and many of the areas um, that we've been working on are on your agenda tonight. So we'll be talking about those as we go along, and, and Mary Beth was very correct. Um, the executive committee went over those, and we'll be following up with you. Uh, at this juncture, I wanted to introduce Alma Gonzalez. Um, we have been working on morale, and Alma has been just a wonderful addition to our staff as the manager of human resources, and she's going to tell you about our employee recognition program. Good evening, everyone. Once again, my name is Alma Gonzalez. I'm the HR manager for IRC, and I'm here tonight to share with everyone our newly revamped employee recognition program for our IRC employees. About a few months ago, an employee recognition committee was formed, and it's comprised of the following managers. Marilu Perez from POS, Denise Adame from Case Control, Sharon Engel from Payroll, Olivia Gutierrez from Case Management, and yours truly from HR. The mission of the committee was to develop an innovative employee recognition program with several categories, incentives, and of course budget to consider. And what we came up with, um, we came up with two categories. The first one is the Hercules Award, and the other one is the Positively Contagious Award. The Hercules Award is awarded to the recipient who has gone above and beyond his and her call of duty. The recipient receives a designated parking for the entire month, a $25 gift certificate, and as well as the honor to display the Hercules Award statue in his or her office. The recipient will then um, have the opportunity to be nominated for the employee of the quarter by the remaining managers and a $50 gift certificate and um, ultimately uh, nominated for the employee of the year selected by the directors and that is with $100 gift certificate. The Positively Contagious Award, um, this is really I'm really excited about, was initially suggested by uh, believe it or not, one of our staff, Erica Sanchez, and she's just very elated that uh, when she found out that we are going to implement um, her idea. And this particular award is given to an IRC employee who personifies a sense of decorum and positivity. Uh, he or she receives designated parking, once again, once a week additional casual day for the whole month, and as well as certificate. Uh, today, we've recognized our very first recipients, and they are the following. Shirley Wise, and she's the Infant Services Coordinator, and she receives the Hercules Award. And for the Positively Contagious Award is given to Guadalupe Sicui, and she's Consumer uh, Services Coordinator. I'm just really excited about this program, and everybody, everyone is, um, you know, just helping us trying to get this program, you know, to better for our employees and such. So we, um, as a committee, we meet once a month, and we're always open to other ideas to better the program. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Will, we be, will these employees' names and the program be placed on our web page? Yes, they will be. Yeah. Well, good. Thank you. Yeah. It was real, it's really exciting, and the employees are recognizing people and um, submitting those names as well. So that brings a lot to the table. Um, I wanted to just clarify a couple of things that have come up in public uh, testimony tonight. One had to do with the um, community being able to participate in, and I think there's some confusion between board meetings versus committee meetings. And in your bylaws, it does speak to that committees that have authority from the board are open to the public. And that includes the executive committee as well as 
Matt, well, oh, it doesn't include Master Trust, I'm sorry. Master Trust is, a, is really operating under corporate affairs only and is not operating under your authority as a board. So the executive committee is the only one that would be open to the public. The other committees are active on different activities and different um, topics that they have wanted to work on, like the new one that we have called Quality Enhancement Committee. That one is not open to the public unless they choose to open their, their meeting for public input. And they can choose to do that and can set up a forum um, to be able to have that happen. But on a regular basis, they do not need to be open and would not ordinarily be open. I hope that clarifies things. Um, our board meetings are always open. So the community is always welcome and is open for them, as well as having the opportunity to give public input at the beginning of the meeting, just like we did tonight. I hope that clarifies. In terms of um, filming, we are getting some bids on what it would take uh, to effectively do filming of the meetings and then we'll um, make a decision if it's something we can go forward with or not, if it's cost effective for us to do that. Um, but we do feel a responsibility um, to make certain that the information gets out in a positive way and the filming's good and that people can really tell what's going on at the meetings and can see that. So we are collecting that information and we'll be able, hopefully, to um, make that happen by next month. Um, I think those were the major things. Um, another issue that did come up had to do with um, a transportation issue, and we are working with access on that and have not completed the total investigative process yet. So we will get back to you on that issue. And the thing that I would like to do next is go over the performance contract year to date. Are you ready? Not ready yet? <laughs> Ad lib. <Yes. laughs> I never could dance real well. So. <laughs> Carol, yes, ma'am. Um, point of the meetings being open, if anyone wants to read uh, the Welfare and Institutions Code, it's Article 3, 4, 6, 6, 0, um, Item B. And it discusses the, the, the board meetings being open and what the authority of the board. It explains what you just said, committees. And the committee, it's, it's in the Welfare and Institutions Code. And our attorney could explain it further. If anyone else has questions, we can actually get it to you in writing. And it is stated in our bylaws as well. Yes. Okay. Um, any any quite other questions that you would yeah, like for me to do? Yes. I'm uncomfortable yeah. having our corporate attorney provide written anything to the public. That's I said to job. me. He, he, he provided it to me. Oh, okay. That's not how he, I heard it. Okay. Excuse me. <laughs> Our attorney provided it to me because I needed to answer no, someone. No, that's fine. So I, if they want it, I can give them that verbiage. But it's also in the Welfare and, Welfare and Institution Code. I, I misheard that. I heard okay. it. I'm sorry. You could ask a question and he'd give you an answer. No, he's not going to. He <laughs> gave, I asked him. He gave me the answer. I also... Have the printout, just in case someone asks me again, because it is, I can understand people wanting to come to the meetings, but there are rules. Okay. Anything else? Are you ready for me to do the performance contract? We're ready. Okay. If you recall, this is a calendar contract. It is not based on fiscal year. So every... <coughs> Every year, at the end of December, we need to compile our numbers and turn those into the state so that they have a good compilation of everything that's happened in every regional center across the state. All of us work on exactly the same public policy measures. So the state is collecting the information based on every single center. And ours has past information for you that ended on 2011. This particular first policy statement is to decrease the number and percent of regional center caseload persons 
in the state developmental centers. And Inland has taken a very aggressive picture and stance on moving people as quickly as we possibly can and as effectively as we can into the community. In 2011, we had 70 persons living in state institutions and were able to move 11. In 2000, at the end of 2012, we had 46, and during that particular year, we had moved 24. Our target for 2013 is to move, assist uh, 10 people in moving, and that, um, so far, through this first six months of our year, of the calendar year, we have been able to move three, so that has taken us down to 43 individuals. So we're right on target, and we know we will hit this. And the next one should be, um, this is a graph to give you a little visual of what we've accomplished. And you can see we've really stepped down quite effectively. We are involved in the closure of Lannerman, and we'll, that's what the, the number 10 is talking about, because we only have six persons uh, residing in Lannerman at this time. The next public policy deals with increase the number and percent of minors that are residing with families or in home settings. And they're classifying home settings to include foster home agencies, and home of the parent or guardian. In 2011, uh, we had 10,914, so we had an increase of 384 people that were living with their families. In 2012, we had increased to 11,626, so our increase in there was 712 people are living with their families. And then our target for 2013 is to have a 4% increase. And that would be, well, actually, we've almost hit it already in these, in these first six months. Um, we had 409 people recorded and living with their families. And so that's a 3.5% increase over the previous year. So we're well on our way with that one. And I think this one also has a graph with you. So you can see how much we've grown and been able to assist people to remain with their families and also, um, or be in a foster family. Okay. Okay, number three these deals with the increase in the number and percent of adults residing in home-like settings. And home-like settings can be um, defined as independent living, supported living, adult family agency homes, as well as the, the consumer's family home. Um, you can see the numbers there in terms of what we've been able to accomplish. In um, 2011, we had an increase of 563, 61, I'm sorry. Uh, 12 was 714 increase. And in 2013, uh, we've already had an increase of 300. And so that we're about, we're a little over halfway of what we need to accomplish. Um, and you can see the distribution below in terms of where people are living today. We have six people that are in foster homes. We have 1,121 in independent living and 9,147 with their families and in supported living, 411 people. That means they're on their own with help? Yes. That one shows you the same, same kind of graph, so you can get a little bit of a better picture. Okay. Um, then this next one, number four, deals with the decrease in the number of minors that are living in facilities of six or more. And here again, we've made um, some pretty good progress on this. And this is, um, really has to do with, well, actually, I'm sorry, we've had an increase this year. Um, and I'll tell you why in just a moment. We have a facility in our area that is called Totally Kids, and it is subacute, and so we many times will wind up having children placed there from other areas. They may not always be our consumer, and with children, many times we don't necessarily get asked to pick those children up that are in subacute. 
and their families um, prefer that they stay with the um, with the other regional center. And right now, um, we've had an increase in this first six months of six over 2012 numbers, which was 18. And the reason for that is we did have some closures of some facilities due to the rate decreases that happened in the Medi-Cal funded homes, which are the ICF homes and skilled nursing homes, et cetera, for children. And we needed to assist those children to move into uh, Totally Kids. So we did have, have an increase in that area. Yes, sir. Um, a little confused because the, on the first column it says uh, serving six or more, and in the middle column it says more than six. So uh, are you trying to keep the number under six, or six or better is okay? We're trying to move, and the four to six, it, well, you're looking at two different types of facilities. This is related to an ICF or a skilled nursing type facility that would be available to people that had pretty significant health issues and medical issues. So I, the four to six um, policy that we're going to talk about in just a little bit is related to the community care licensed homes, not the health licensed homes. Does that answer your question? Um, it's a little bit the semantics. The, the, the first column says decreased number of minors living in facilities serving six or more. Right. And then the first sentence, the next one says, IRC has children at subacute facilities serving more than six children. And the reason that we put that statement in there is because most times subacute type facilities are going to be larger than six. Oh, I see. Uh -huh. It's if you can think about it as the skilled nursing type facilities, or subacute is like a step down from a hospital. Oh, and many times those homes and facilities yeah. are larger than six. Okay. Does that help? Thank you. Okay. Um, number five? Thank you. This is decrease the number and percent of adults living in facilities serving more than six. And we'll get into that kind of discussion in a little bit later. Um, we have been able to decrease those numbers, and um, we've, we're down 11 in just these first six months from the um, previous year. And are you on number six? One more. Okay. This one has to do with um, keeping up and making certain that everybody has a current client development evaluation report or the early start report. And both of those are very, very important and things that we always have to keep up to date so that we know exactly what um, the evaluation is of that particular consumer. That is done on an annual basis, and we work very, very hard to keep those up to date and current. Any questions about some of the po public policy issues or the things that we've been able to perform thus far? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Carol. <laughs> Financial report. Well, the year ended well. Uh, our administration budget ended. We actually had $18,366 left. <laughs> However, <laughs> Ten thousand dollars, and now we have to give back to the federal government. It's a program they have, and since we didn't spend the money, they don't let you keep it. <laughs> I don't understand. Uh, the other part, about eight thousand dollars, is being reserved for uh, unpaid bills that we haven't received yet. We have to leave a window open. So. That part of the budget worked out well, and the uh, uh, purchase of service budget, the one that we're always in a deficit in. We basically have a deficit of about nine million dollars. Five, almost six hundred million, or excuse me, six million dollars of that is for bills that have not been received. And the state has assured our finance department that they will send us a check for the nine million dollars. So we basically ended the year okay. So next month we will start talking about this year's budget. Questions? No. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
do we run over budget because the number of people we're serving uh, increased more than we expected? It's based on services required. So yeah, we have more people, we have more services, but it could also be you could have less people and still go over budget. Oh, okay. Because it's based, it's a basically an entitlement program. And once it's in the IPP, then they, uh, the individuals, consumers get the services. So if somebody went from, um, you know, living at home to an acute facility, those services would go up. So yeah, it's part of it is because we have more consumers. But you can actually have a decrease the way it's explained to me and still be spending more money. Okay. Patrick, do you remember what the uh, deficit was last year? Madam President. Oh, Barry, we can't. You can't speak from the audience, please. Oh. Patrick, Sorry. Patrick said, go ahead. Well, no, I have questions, questions for the board. The board. <laughs> from, from the moment okay. after public. <laughs> Everything that's questioned is from the board. Okay. Now you're observers. <laughs> okay. Anything else from the board? <laughs> Do you need anything approved? Nope. Okay. We're fine. Health benefits. I would like that uh, move to the executive session, closed session. The health benefits? Yes, because it is covered under. Section 4663A3, Employee Salaries and Benefits. Do we have a motion to move this to the executive? I'll move that if I can. We can make that motion to have that stated exactly so that Jennifer can write it. I move that. What? I move <laughs> that. <laughs> Item 3, Health Benefits for 2013-14. Be moved to executive session pursuant to section 4663, small a, three of the Welfare and Institution Code. Thank you, Patrick. You're welcome. Jennifer's just getting used to doing this. We're hoping that. <laughs> we, have a we have a second right for this. Down. Well, Tom and <laughs> Tom can have the second. It's been moved and seconded that we move this item to the closed session. Do I have any discussion? Hearing no discussion, I'm going to take the vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? It's so moved. Okay. <coughs> Service contract approval. I'm up again. You're up again. Okay. You should all have in front of you a piece of paper that looks like this. Okay. It has a back side. It has a back side, yeah, front and back. Okay. <laughs> Somebody put it on my mic, not me. Okay. Sorry. As you remember, a couple of meetings ago, we approved a new policy that required all contracts that are over $250,000 to be approved by the board. Now, we have an interesting situation at IRC. We kind of enter into contracts, and we kind of don't. What that really means is, is we go out to somebody, or they come to us, and they want to perform a service. We estimate what the cost of that service is. We enter into an agreement, but it's not like a contract where I'm going to go out and buy cups, and I agree to buy a thousand cups for a dollar a cup. It's if we provide any service, if we use you, then we're going to pay you. So the problem comes in is towards the end of the year, we would get a glut of people, oh look, you've already spent $249,000, we need to have this contract approved. So what staff has recommended, and the business committee is concurring with, is that we take a proactive approach based on past spending. We put together a list, which you have, that says these are firms or companies or providers, vendors, who there's a high likelihood that we will exceed the $250,000. Okay. Today, not one of those people are close to that. But in six months or eight months or ten months, they might be. So based on past history, we're asking the uh, business committees recommending that the board approve doing business with those 50 firms 
based on the assumption that they will exceed the $250,000 mark. If they go to $300,000, it, you know, it's not a firm fixed contract like most of us are used to dealing with. Some of them might not make the $250,000 mark. And what they spent last year is not necessarily an indication of what they'll spend this year, but it's the closest we have to try to be proactive. All right, the recommendation from the business committee is that the board approve <coughs> these, how many did you say it was? 50. It's 50. 50. I counted 50, 50 contractors. Do I hear a motion? Do I? So moved. All right. That we, uh, the board approve the 50 contractors who might go over 250000 during the course of this year. It's been moved. Do I hear a second? I'm saying yes. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded that we approve these 50 contracts. Any discussion? Questions? I have one because I'm confused. Um, <laughs> it says, we're going to say, it says in here that we're supposed to According to where the, 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 the board is, according to the Lantern Act, that the board is supposed to um, review and approve any contract that's over $250,000. So you're saying that some of these could be over $250,000. You're asking us to let the business committee take care of all the contracts, correct? Is that what you're saying? No. No, Without, hmm? I'm asking you to approve those 50 contracts. Okay. What if they go over 250000 And they've been approved, and we can pay the bill when it gets to $250,001. Okay. If they're not approved, mm -hmm. then throughout the year, you will get a series of these contracts coming okay. through. And if the contract isn't at $250,000, it wouldn't go to the board. But then two days after the board meeting, it could hit $251,000. And in theory, then we can't do business with that firm any longer. Okay, so it, my question, I think, is is it okay to do that according to the land owner? That's what my understanding, yes. It is. Yes. Okay. Otherwise, that's I wouldn't be recommending. That's what I was worried about, <laughs> that we were, you know, in um, doing what the land owner says. Because the way I look at it is that the regional board of we're supposed to okay the contracts. And, and you, I feel like we're looking... Today. Mm -hmm. You are today. Okay. Now, if we have somebody... the recommendation of the business committee. Okay. But we're the ones that are approving the contract. Right, the business committee is not. Okay. No. And later in the year, you could get three more to come up, or 50 more. Because there could be somebody who we didn't guess right. This is all based pretty much on past, correct, Dennis? It's based on past experience with these firms. Okay. Yeah. I just want to kind of clarify that. Yeah, so you can get more mm -hmm. as the year goes on. Right. These, these are generally uh, purchase of service contracts. They're all purchase of service, yes. Dennis, okay. do you have anything else to add to this for clarification or Marissa? No, the only thing is, Patrick is, is, was right, it's the... Um, we looked at the contracts based upon past history, and we are of the belief that these 50 contracts will go over $250,000. They may not, but we believe they will. And being that we have, have a um, reasonable suspicion that they're going to go over that, it's prudent to get approval for that. Thank you. And these are all contracts that we have worked with in the past. Yes. Yes. 250 grand is not a large amount relative to 250 million dollar budget. That's one tenth of one percent. But it complies with the Lanterman Act. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's the Lanterman Act. That's and our policy. Yeah. So it needs to be done. Thank you. Any other discussion? <coughs> All my questions were answered. Mm -hmm. I had my hand up three times. Okay. We'll talk real good with this. Okay. <laughs> Motion carried. And we'll add one thing. It has nothing to do with the vote. 
the business committee is going to be looking at how our contracts are all put together. All right, and you'll bring us that if we change anything. All right. I like it the way it is. All right, I like it the way it is. Okay. Right, Jack? I don't know. <laughs> Jack's being reviewed tomorrow. He doesn't know <laughs> Quality Enhancement Committee. Denise, you're up. Okay. Um, our not this meeting tonight, but our last meeting, we were discussing, um, since we're still relatively new at this stuff, we were discussing what kind of, um, where we were going to focus our committee on, where, what area of global looking at everything, what would be the thing that we would want to focus on at the moment. We um, had attended a town hall meeting, and out of that town hall meeting, it was um, had to do with adult services, um, employment, other kind of things like that. So our committee last month chose for our first, for our first focus, we are going to be looking at adult services and employment. Um, what we're going to try to do in, um, we really are a quarterly meeting committee, but we've been meeting every month just because we're new and we're getting it together, but um, we're, since we're looking at adult issues, um, we were thinking um, of having a focus group meet by the beginning of the year. Um, it will be open to all everybody, but the focus is this time going to be adult services, and um, because we can't, when we started the committee, Carol and I had spoken about where we could focus different things. We can't globally take care of everything, so we had to pick one thing at a time, and so our first thing is going to be adult services. Um, we will open that, you know, open that up to Whoever wants to come to our focus meeting in January or February. Um, we're also asked to um, to attend a, a few uh, meetings with um, the 102 vendors, um, our some of our directors, our program managers, in keeping with the adult um, programs and. Um, employment, the vendors are getting together and trying to tweak some of the things that they have um, to get our, to look into different ways that we can enhance the, the programs for the adults. Um, we've found that a lot of, uh, a lot of, through our um, town hall meeting, we found a lot of information out on how many consumers are sitting home um, not attending anything, not working, not doing anything. So we're going to be looking into all of that. We have met with uh, this vendor group um, on July 22nd. We met again August 1st. And we'll be meeting September 4th. The vendors are coming back to let us know what they came up with, what kind of a creative thing that they came up with um, to see how we can enhance services and stuff. So we're waiting for that. Um, September 4th meeting and it's been really kind of exciting to get to get that going and, and looking at our first focus is for the adults so I just wanted everybody to know that that's what we're up to and um, we're probably after we meet September 4th then we're going to be <coughs> coming back to our quality enhancement committee and seeing you know, what, what they brought to us so that's about it. <coughs> Yeah, and we're not meeting again for uh, in September. We're going to meet in October, so it gives us some time to see what we got. Did you have the um, number of adults who are sitting home without a program? We don't have that information. We did request it, but I don't know how we're going to do it. We did ask that at one of the at one of the meetings. We did ask if we could get the numbers of. Um, Hmm? What? Just I said name. my son's. That's yeah, I know. Two. <laughs> I know yours is. But yeah, I, I think we should be able to get this one. Could we, could we get that? Because that would kind of be an interesting thing, especially for our committee to see. I'd like to know how many adults yeah. are at home with that. Thank 
It sounds like you're making a lot of progress. I'm glad that you will be having an open meeting in February. We'll make sure that goes out on the uh, on the uh, web so people will know about that. Can I ask a quick question? The vendors that you're meeting with, how did that get fixed? They're the I don't really know. We just got invited to come to meet okay. with them. It was the um, I think it's the behavior the one oh two is which meeting did they attend? One oh two vendors. Which meeting? Donita. Yeah, the, the 102 vendors. I met with uh, Beth Burt and Lavinia and myself. And that, that primarily is the behavior management yeah. um, vendors. So 102 vendors. Most of them were affiliated with the um, vendor advisory committee. It was one of those meetings that happened prior to the vendor advisory committee. So pretty bad. Pretty bad. Mm -hmm. Because they pretty do combine them with the day program and the behavior. That's how it it is for, I know, the pre -back. Um, the So you met at that meeting with the vendors? Is that what I'm hearing? There were vendors in attendance, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. There were vendors. There were also um, outside um, organization came. So if some if a vendor wanted to participate in this and be a part of it, can they? Or is it kind of the chosen <laughs> thing? Yeah. It's, I think it's just I think it's just a discussion at this point. There's there's nothing, and I think that others could be part of the discussion. It came out of the uh, autism town hall, basically that meeting, and so it's just the, sort of the next step. Okay. But uh, I think I don't see any reason why others shouldn't be involved. But at this point, it may be too soon to open it up widely, just okay. because it's a discussion. <coughs> Pre vet. Back leader is the one that shows it. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. And that's where that's going to Okay. Okay. Vendor Advisory Committee. Ms. Simpson, welcome to the crew. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I actually do not have a, a report to give because we haven't had our um, back yet. So. We have our meeting uh, next week, Monday, on the 19th at 10 a.m. here in this room. So uh, we'd like for people to come and join us. Occasionally that happens. Yes. <laughs> so you will report next month. Yes. Okay, well, thank you. Are you enjoying the meeting? I am. Good. <laughs> I'm glad. Consumer. Advocate Committee, Mr. Miller, hello. Hello. I see you. Well, it's been a while. But for those who don't know me, I don't really need this. I have a loud voice anyway. But anyway, <laughs> my name is Stephen Miller. I am the Assistant Training Specialist for the Community Information and Training Unit and also the liaison for the Consumer Advisory Committee at the Regional Center. Uh, as we have approached mid-year, uh, I'm proud to announce that CAC is growing. Uh, we've had some events come this have passed, you know, the past few months, starting with Monte Carlo night, which was a great success this year. Uh, <coughs> thank you to the, all the uh, volunteers and all of uh, Inroad staff for helping us. Um, July 19th, we, uh, the CAC was very uh, pleased with what we had a movie night on July 19th where we actually watched a movie and had a, pop, a movie theater theme up here in Route 66. Um, another thing is, um, just to let you guys know, um, I have a couple of events that I would really like to uh, announce for everybody. Uh, for this, for those who don't know about the CAC, it's for consumers that we serve here at IRC 16 and older. The first event that I'd like to really, and it's over on the table in the front, is our CAC bowling night, which is the 22nd of this month here at the EMF Bowling Lanes. Um, this is a, an event that's hosted by the CAC, and we do it every year, and it's for two hours of bowling for $22. Unlimited bowling, pizza, drinks, cookies, Shoe rental, and I feel that's a great way to really get the consumers to come together and not only socialize, but hey, 
we all want to get active sooner or later. What a great way to uh, get some exercise. Um, next month, how many of you guys like ice cream? The CAC is hosting an ice cream social. It's going to be here at uh, the conference center in Route 66 uh, for Friday, September 13th. Two dollars. All you can uh, eat. Uh, ice cream, okay. Mm -hmm. All you can eat. <laughs> so if you want to make yourself and enjoy yourself and get sick, be my guest. <laughs> now, if for the board members, you guys, it's been a while since you got my uh, letter in your packets. Uh, if you guys look on the back side, I really want you guys to take a look. These uh, ladies here are our board members for the CAC. Starting from the left to the right, that's Amy Lee, who is our CAC president. Uh, in the middle, that's Stephanie Rodriguez, who's our vice president. And then to the far right, Keila Bell is our secretary. Uh, we did have a secretary named uh, Bianca Olmos. Uh, she resigned, and last month, <coughs> Keila was um, um, voted back in as uh, our secretary. So, if you have any events, or uh, any questions about the CAC, don't hesitate to ask me. You can call me, email me, and I'll be glad to help you, to let you know what's going on with the CAC. Uh, just to let you know, the CAC will have a booth at the Harvest Festival, October 26th. And in November, the CAC is going to actually volunteer in the community and make a difference in our community. Okay? Thank you. Stephen, do you want to tell them a little bit about the Harvest Festival on the 26th? The Harvest Festival is a time for where, back in the days, we used to have what we call a family fun festival. Uh, we, starting last year, the Harvest Festival is like that. This is a chance for our families to come and have a day of fun, uh, getting together, uh, meeting each other, uh, doing things. Finding out what different resources are in the community. Because believe it or not, um, we have a lot of, over 28,000 consumers we provide services to. They don't always know about the services that we have in our communities. Because you can think about it, 33, 000, about 33,000 square miles that we cover in both counties. Our, there's, our CACs do a lot of work, but you know what? This is a chance for our families to come together and get out, have fun, learn something new, you know. Last year, we had nearly a thousand people attend our first uh, Harvest Festival. And we're hoping to target about a thousand people this year as well. <coughs> Any questions? All right, thank you. Thank and you. I will see you guys in uh, October's meet. Yeah. Thank you. All right, thank you. Actually, do need the mic. Good evening. Um, since we last met, it has been a couple of months. Um, well, I'll, I'll start off with some of the good news that we have for another way. We have been selected for a few more grants in the last two months. We were funded by Union Bank Foundation for $10,000. Um, it is for any unmet need for our clients here at the Regional Center. We also received a grant from the um, Arrowhead United Way. We've been funded um, five years in a row for, again, uh, basic needs. It is specific to certain zip codes, uh, Colton, San Bernardino, the mountain area, Rialto, Fontana, and Muscoy are the zip codes that they cover. Um, and we're honored and privileged to be selected five years in a row. Uh, they have had closed grant uh, applications for three years, so it pretty much is the same agencies that get funded each year, and we ha have been fortunate to be on that list. Uh, we are also proud to know from United Way that they have opened up those applications to employers in the community and United Way uh, members. So we now are getting donations monthly from several county agencies and uh, corporations in the county to, for individual donations from um, the Sheriff's Department and um, Ingram Micro Target now it gives us checks every month for another way. So this is a new uh, area of um, donations, but we're honored to be included in that. Um, 
in and out Burger, again, for the fourth year, has funded us for $10,000. Um, it is for children uh, that are either have had a case of abuse or neglect. It does not have to have an open case with CPS. Uh, the first time we wrote the grant five years ago, it, we earmarked the money for children who were shaken babies, thinking um, we knew that we had a lot of children that um, based on their, you know, were disabled based on some kind of abuse, and um, we were flooded with requests that year. So every year we've gotten, um, you know, more referrals. Uh, last year, the selection that we made for the grant was for Mountain Shadows, an ICF facility, who we selected the children in four different facilities for them to get any unmet medical need and or Christmas toys during the holiday. So we are just granted this year and we're looking for new recipients. So, you know, welcome staff to submit applicants for that. Um, the Community Foundation, uh, the grant was submitted just this month. It is for uh, general operating support, unrestricted funding for another way. Um, and there's also a second grant for just wheelchair users. Uh, we're hopeful. We've been funded three years in a row from the Community Foundation. Our hope is that we will continue to be funded. I think those were all the grants. Um, I do would like to report since we last met about the golf tournament. Uh, for those that attended, Mr. Ashton, Jack, thank you so much for coming. Um, we sold out. Uh, it was great news. We had 154 golfers. We had overflow onto another golf course. We had um, a tremendous amount of support, and I'm honored to report we raised over $136,000 for the golf tournament. There are expenses, and uh, but uh, truthfully, um, in this economy, with lots of nonprofits uh, vying for dollars, and uh, most nonprofits choosing not to do special events because it's expensive and sometimes not worth the effort and the effort and all the support that it requires to do a large event. So we know how extraordinary it was to raise that kind of funding, and it truly is because of the people that believe in another way in our clients that we were able to do that. Yes, sir. That number after expenses? No, it's about um, 82,000 after expenses. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. Still, Still really, really yeah. good for a special event. Yeah, so really honored about that. We mostly, as you know, most of the items that get donated for us, all the big prizes, the Bob who does our great prizes, <laughs> uh, TVs by, you know, um, great, uh, almost I think this year was $37,000 worth of gifts were donated to us for this event. So that's what makes the difference for this. and. So thank you to everyone who made that possible. Um, we are honored to announce as well new officers for Another Way. We were remiss in not having elections, but our, our new president is Carolina Laura from the School Age Unit. She's been Another Way member longer than I have been, and she won't say how many years, but longer than me, and I've been here 19 years. Um, then we have Eric Anderson, uh, who's relatively new uh, here to the Regional Center. He's the co-chair of Another Way. Um, Sandra Guzman, our nice esteemed person across the table, <laughs> she uh, took one for the team for secretary, I know, so thank you Sandra. And then um, Sandra Ruiz, who's an intake um, and been a long-standing member of Another Way, is the new treasurer for Another Way. So I applaud all the members, of not only the officers, but the almost 32 other acting members of Another Way, who take time out of their 40 hour work week to sit and listen to requests every Wednesday to help for all these events to make them successful and it speaks to the integrity and the quality of the staff here at Regional Center. So, um, you know, we wish uh, all the new officers luck in the next two years. We're going to keep them busy. I would like to say as well, the only other event that's coming up, um, and I spoke briefly at the last time, it just had been elected to this new group called the IECC for 21 nonprofits in San Bernardino County that are going to be putting a, an event together. It was supposed to be a triathlon up in Lake Arrowhead, and we ran into some trouble with uh, permits from Caltrans. So um, we have moved to an event in November 16th. It was a 5K walk, run, and roll. So we're welcoming clients with disabilities. Um, it's an integrated active, uh, event with uh, proceeds to benefit. Um, clients of the regional center as well as 21 other nonprofits in San Bernardino County. So I do have flyers. I'll leave them out in the front. 
We hope that you can come out to participate in this event. It is a first of its kind. Uh, we have gotten great support from foundations who are looking at um, this group as a collaborative and to see how it can be um, modeled in other communities. So um, I'll give details about that in the flyer and hopefully we can post it maybe in regional center website. Um, I think, am I missing anything? No, I think that's it. I, because of this group, we have been asked to speak at the next uh, county supervisor meeting with uh, uh, specifically to speak about how the collaborative came together and how we're working together to um, better the community in San Bernardino County. That's it. Any questions for me? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for all your work. You're welcome. We are to the old business, 465. Are our speakers going to speak after? All right. If, while I'm walking over to the mic, can all of you pull out the um, cover memo and the two page statement that we put together? Please. It's on the uh, 4 to 6 bed task force. Just to give you a little background, um, this was something that we felt we needed to <clears throat> work on, and uh, the board gave staff approval back in April to review uh, the four to six bed policy and the way that we were operating. And at that time, we asked uh, board members, which was Jennifer Baca and Mary Beth Field. We also had three providers um, that were asked to participate. It was Barry Solomon, uh, Tina Minders, and Glenn Smith. And then on staff uh, was Trevor Webster, Vince Toms, Margie Henderson, and myself. And we had a total of seven meetings um, to go through the process and to talk through what we felt we needed to do as an organization. Also, to just give you a little bit of history, um, you saw in the performance contract that one of the major focuses was to help people live in their own community and to move people from large institutional um, type programs, which in our state is the state institutions. So our goal was to assist people to move from those institutions back to the community and also live in smaller living arrangements, independent living and supported living and then the um, community-based facilities or what we're open to people. Um, the other thing that we took a look at is back in 1988, Inland Regional Center chose to provide continued support for small living arrangements. And that, for Inland, meant four or fewer people living in a home that gives a consumer the opportunity for his own room and offers that high quality of living. Um, the community placement plan, and again, this is the plan that we work on and have worked on for many years, of assisting people to move from the state institutions. Those homes are four bed or less, and they're li <coughs> excuse me, licensed as such. Also, um, back in July of 2013, it was brought to everyone's attention um, that we knew that the rates that were being paid for those, for the community care licensed homes was grossly inadequate. And it was mentioned earlier in terms of the alternative rate model. And if someone, are you familiar with what that is? Do you need a little explanation of, we refer to it as the ARM rate program? Does everyone understand the ARM program? I'm game. I was <laughs> You're game on that one. Um, basically, it was the way that facilities were wanting to deliver their services. And there's a level one, two, three, and four. The level one is a straight, and it can't even be an unlicensed facility, it's a straight boarding care type facility. A person may choose to live there, and the funding that it goes to the provider is usually the same amount as SSI. So today it's about 963. <coughs> 993, thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> Level two um, is a one to six staffing ratio, and that's just a little step above um, 
the, um, the level ones. The level three is a one to three staffing ratio. And again, you're looking for additional support and additional um, services for the individuals that move into those homes. And as this one, two, and three, four go up, then the rates go up. Um, level fours, these are um, primarily designed for people that do have, of course, a few more significant needs. Sometimes it's behavioral and sometimes it's health or a combination. And it goes from 4A to 4I. And 4I is the highest rate and um, is looking at the most challenging people to work with in the community. Um, these, uh, the, the thing that was brought up earlier is that the arm rates have not been changed or looked at in the way that they're structured since the early 1990s. So the point that the gentleman made about that rate being terribly antiquated and that it really does need to be reviewed is very accurate and true. That was one of the commitments that was made by the group and we have that in our recommendation that the regional center would work alongside the providers to have that structure of rates evaluated and also looked at for increases. And that's going to take some work, for sure. Also, Inland, since 1999, and there was also a law that was passed at that point in time that wanted homes to be for, um, I'm sorry, wanted it to be six beds. No larger than, I'm sorry, it had to be four beds was the intent, but it could not be any larger than six. And that was the desire of this piece of legislation. And Inland actually started adopting that kind of living setting back in 1988. So we were ahead of the curve on that, and the, um, the law came into effect in it, there was a piece of it that came in in, 19, in the early 1990s, and then it was actually passed in 1999. So what we are recommending at this point in time is that we continue working toward four-bed homes. We also work with the providers to gain an equitable rate. As we're working through this process, we would like to be able to do two referrals to the currently licensed and vendored six-bed homes that do have vacancies and were identified back in 1999, two referrals for those vendored as four-bed homes with vacancies. We also emphasized and acknowledged that the choice of the placement does indeed lie with the consumer and their family. On, on the um, information that we gave to you, there's a list of reasons and, and situations and then a method of increasing the vendor capacity um, of a home. And we can talk about any of those areas that you may have some questions about. But our main recommendation is that we continue moving forward with licensing and vendoring at four beds, and that if there is existing six bed homes in the community, those that are vendored, that were licensed and vendored back in 1999, prior, prior to 1999, that those facilities would continue to receive two referrals if they had a vacancy, and that the existing four bed homes would have the same opportunity. So when, when a case manager came to the placement team and they needed referrals, then the um, quality assurance team would provide two referrals for four beds and two referrals for those that qualified six, six bed license, six bed vendor. Questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, are you aware of any six bed homes that have been vendorized uh, post-1999? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. And those are vendored usually for four. They may be licensed for six, oh, but they are vendored for four. And in certain situations, if there is a dire need, 
then um, there might be a recommendation for that home that has a vacancy, because they would. We would need to increase the vendor category, the capacity, I'm sorry, to five at, for that person to go in. But it would be an exception, and there would need to be um, director level approval on that situation. <coughs> Jack, did you have a question? No. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, sir. My understanding is we have more vacancies than we have consumers. That is true. We move into a home, and the general center says, okay, well, we're going to vendor for you to move into that home. And then temporary doesn't mean that they're going to end up having to move out within a certain amount of time, correct? But as long as there is not a time placed on that. But in the, in the meantime, we would assist that family to possibly look at some other options that they might be willing to consider. Sometimes it's also an emergency where a home closes and the family may know that provider and that's where they feel the safest at that point in time. So it is something that we would continually look at, but there's not a specific time frame placed on when that person has to be moved. So the client, I guess, will not be in fear that they're going to have to have to be moved by the regional center. There's not any stipulation. They know that it is temporary, and but there again, there's no deadline, if you will. Other questions? So you have the recommendation in front of you in the way that we would like to move forward with this. I might be moving forward. Okay, you're going to make a motion to accept the letter as written, or the, the recommendation as written? Yeah, written. You, you want us to accept the recommendation as written? Yeah. All right, it's been moved that we accept the, the recommendation that we accept. <laughs> As okay, do I have a second? Yes. I'll second. I'll second. Do we have any discussion? I have a suggestion on the recommendation. Okay. Yeah, I thought I get it right. I know. No, in the, uh, on page two, paragraph that starts in a show of IRC's commitment, where we're going to provide two referrals. Yes. And, you know, to each type, I think we should put in parentheses if available. Because it says we're going to provide two referrals. But it also says happen. with with vacancies. Okay. Um, but that might be an additional clarification that you can certainly make. Okay. That was deeply discussed. Okay. <laughs> because a lot of times a home might be needed that we don't really even have. So you, you're talking about all the vacancies, but if you were to look at how many four I homes that we have, it's very, you know, few openings. The, it, it, we have a whole lot of opportunities. A lot. And that's majorly where our openings are. So yes, it would have to be if it's available. But it's kind of a given. It's what we actually did in this paragraph was to honor the... Uh, pre-1999 homes and the post-1990 homes, giving them sort of an, an even and not forcing them out of their six bed. Like if they lost a consumer, they went down to five, and of course we're trying to fill these poor fours, so it's kind of giving, spreading it out. But the most important part, if you look, page two, paragraph two, <coughs> We acknowledge that the choice of placement lies with the consumer and the family. And that was one of the things that I was really hoping for. That it is a consumer and family choice. Any other questions or discussion on this? We do have a comment. All right, now we have a comment. That's okay. It's the time, isn't it? It's the time. 
think regional centers have been put in a really terrible position by the state of California. The state's asking us to try to enforce a policy, which I think is perfect. I mean, I'd like to see every consumer, one consumer to a home. So four is good, okay? But they don't want to fund it. <coughs> so they want us to be the policeman, and they want us to be the server, and I think they put us between the proverbial rock and a hard spot. The vendors need to make a living, our consumers need to be able to have a room to themselves. And we're stuck trying to make the consumers happy, trying to make the vendors happy, trying to make the state of California happy, and nobody's paying us to do that. That's why so. if you read the letter, it will tell you that we are going to go. I, am, I read the letter. Okay. I understand. We are I'm just, this is the time, I think. We'll okay. Are you going to go arm in arm with us up there? I've been okay. up there before. I'll go up there again. Okay, good. <laughs> Write that down. Any other questions? You already know it very good. I have a question, and I think I'm just going to weigh on it. <laughs> Any other discussion or... Comments? Melvin, you know why you know it? Because, because uh, you two live in a group of Fontana. Yes. And uh, six bed. And now we're now, in? Um, now I live in a by myself. Good for you. Good for you. Good for you. I'm glad you made the motion. I think to a bar. Thank you. No more questions or comment. I call for the vote. All those in favor? Oh, yeah, uh, wait. Uh, oh. You had a member of the audience <laughs> who held their talk until now. Thank you for reminding me. I retract the vote. Terry, would you like to speak now? No, it was actually. No, I'd like you to vote first, actually. <laughs> 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 Did you want us to vote? Come on. Please vote. Your, your input may sway their vote. No, 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 no. I, I will make a comment after. Please vote. All right. Let's try again. You guys are making me look really bad. No, you look great. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carried. Who would like to go first? <laughs> All right. Five minutes. Five minutes. After you give your introduction and salutation, five minutes on the timer. I'll do this. <laughs> Your time is start now. Thank you. Dennis, a little clarification. Carol, please correct me if I'm if I'm wrong. When a um, group or an individual wants to be has been licensed and approaches IRC for vendorization, they don't have to vendorize them for four. They have to vendorize them, but they can vendorize them for one. That's true. Or two, or three, up to four. That's true. That's where there is some room for management of those resources and facilities that are, that are out there. Is that correct? Mm. Okay. So, um, <laughs> just some, some real kudos here. Um, there's been a whole bunch of um, negative comments about IRC over the years, um, and I just want to say this. The folks that we worked with uh, in management to get this thing done, uh, as well as the board members, uh, all the names were mentioned before, I won't go through the names, was absolutely fantastic. It was, it was just unbelievable, the collaboration, <coughs> the concern, the sensitivities, um, for the consumers, for IRC, for the vendors. Um, a lot of people put a lot of time into this, a lot of personal time, um, driving miles and miles over and over. It was amazing. It was really absolutely fantastic. The attitude was great. Um, I want to say that, that I honestly believe that's, that stems from the top and it flows down. Um, guys, thank you so much. It was really it was a, a wonderful experience. and. Um, we hope to continue meeting and address some other minor issues. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Do I have to wait for you to call me or? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> She's got to fix her timer, though. All right. I can wait for that. Okay. All righty. Um, I have been working in this field since 1984, and specifically coming involved with the regional center <laughs> since 87, and um, was shocked when there was a policy about four beds already in 88. That had kind of blew my mind because we often heard there might be a policy, but it was not public or open or transparent. And um, we even opened many six beds after that time. It, it was a very confusing era in the past. And I'm as pleased as can be that we were able to work this out together with vendors, board, and management staff here at IRC. And we'll be able to publicly let everybody know, all the vendors, there won't be a question, there won't be conspiracy theories or ideas that somebody's out to get somebody. And um, after a lot of years, that's really nice because we all know what's going on and it's going to be in writing and it's going to be clear for everybody who's going on. And again, just to reiterate what Barry has said, that um, it was a pleasure to work on this group. It was hard work sometimes. We worked hard, and people, I think Vince produced more information and paperwork than anybody I know. Um, again, we can't say enough about Vince. He should be the Hercules and the, what's the other one? The positive, contagious spirit. He should have that award all in one if we could make a recommendation. <laughs> um, it's been um, a really good and positive experience and um, not what you would say... Um, Nobody just gave in and said, okay, this is the way it is, and we'll just go along. There was serious hard work and consideration down to the very last two or three words that were put into this. And um, we just really appreciate that there was this type of involvement and um, commitment to working together and not against each other. So. Thank you. Thank you. From the staff's standpoint, it was definitely an honor um, to be able to get the group together and work through this. Um, because as you, as you know, and those of you who have been regional center um, staff, you know what it's like to walk through something like this and come out with a really positive, workable, collaborative statement at the end. And we're make it work. So, thank you all very, very, very much. And thank you, staff. I really appreciated all that staff did. And Vince, you should be nominated. <laughs> <laughs> Barry, if I could nominate you also, I would. I can't believe the length of the players that you've had. You know, that was March a lot of work. Second, it'll be here. I know. I, for myself, and I'm, I'm sure I can speak for Jennifer, we, we really enjoyed um, working this through. It was a lot of work, but it was, I could see it constantly getting better. I really appreciate everyone came and worked hard. Thank you. Thank you. Now we go on to SB 468, self-determination. Are we ready, Ms. Cummings? Good evening. Good evening. I wanted to provide you with some information regarding a current bill that is pending called um, Senate Bill 468, which is a self-determination bill. Um, per ARCA, the Association of Regional Center Agencies, they say that this bill is, uh, proposes the single largest change to the regional center system in more than a decade. Um, the bill would require the department contingent upon approval of federal funding to establish and implement a state self-determination program that would be available in every regional center catchment area to provide participants and their families within an individual budget amount, um, increased flexibility and choice, and greater control over decisions, resources, and needed desired services and supports to implement their IPP. 
um, ARCAS and regional centers strongly support the concept of the self-determined um, services. When properly developed, it would empower individuals with developmental disabilities to make customized decisions regarding the expenditure of funds on their behalf through the creative use of resources. It can be a powerful tool to address historical funding differences related to a number of factors, including geographic isolation, limited English proficiency, and cultural preferences for home-based rather than facility-based care. Um, currently, the, the bill has, was recently amended August 6th. It's scheduled to be heard in the Assembly Human Services Committee tomorrow <coughs> in a hearing. And also, just to let you know, with the legislative process, the last day for policy for committee, I'm sorry, the last day for bills to be passed out of policy committees, such as the Human Services Committee, is August 8th, or August 16th, and the last day for bills to be passed out of fiscal committees is August 30th. So the time is upon us. Um, with that being said, there has been some concern about the current language and model that's being proposed in the self-determination program. So we wanted to keep you apprised of um, all of the information that is available at this time. Um, ARCA recently drafted a very well-articulated letter to Senator Emerson, who is the author of the bill, um, outlining some of the current concerns in the current proposed language and has recommended some amendments to the bill. Um, just to give you some highlights of some of the concerns, um, it would entail the current budget, Beth, excuse me, budget methodology that would help determine what the individual budget amounts would be for consumers. Currently, the bill is looking at looking at the average of the last two years of purchase of service funding and providing 98% of that budget. Also, in the bill, the consumer would be responsible for paying fees for an independent facilitator, as well as a um, financial management service, those fees would be taken out of that 98% budget. Um, ARCA is also proposing that the budget methodology also includes other information that they uh, take into account medical conditions of the consumer, um, functional capacity and limitations, living arrangement, availability of unpaid supports, social environment, geographic isolation, behavioral complexities. At that time, at this time, those items are not in the bill when determining the methodology. It's basically based on two years of budget. There's also a concern about what would happen with newer consumers that don't have that two-year history and how their budgets would be determined. Um, the bill refers to a conflict of interest-free independent facilitator. Currently, it excludes the service coordinator unless the um, consumer chose not to have a facilitator, then they can choose to use a CSC. Um, there have been previous pilot projects which shows that the service coordination of the regional center has been very successful. Um, it's also setting up local advisory committees as well as a statewide um, committee. And currently the bill is written so that there is statewide consistency across all regional centers, so the viability or the value of having local advisory committees is a question. The bill would also require that the money is advanced to the consumer prior to the purchase of service. And this is um, different from the regional center current accounting system that funds services in arrears after services have been provided. So it's a question about how that would happen, uh, especially when we have um, delayed budget approvals from the governor and legislature. We have cash flow um, concerns, and so that could be problematic. So in summary, if the bill is not carefully administered, it could potentially make existing services and access inequities more pronounced rather than um, the intent of the bill. Um, ARCA believes that the piece, uh, the piece of legislation requires more major modifications in order to create a real workable model for uh, California. 
to give you a little history, uh, a pilot project was started in, in 1998 with legislation that started uh, pilot projects, pilot programs. A total of five regional centers participated. Some of those programs continue today, and they have um, a lot of valuable input that we're not seeing has been taken into consideration in the new bill. Um, there have also been other attempts to implement self-directed or self-determination programs. In 2005, um, there was a self-directed option uh, provided by the legislature. DDS submitted an application for a federal waiver in order to implement that program. However, um, that had to be suspended because it would have required the Department of Developmental Services to purchase services directly, which we don't recontract with vendors to do that. In 2009, there was another attempt with the passage of Assembly Bill 9, which gave the option for an individual choice budget, um, and that hasn't been implemented. And in the last legislative session, there was another attempt for self-determination, which died in uh, the Senate Human Services Committee. Uh, I don't have the reasons for that specifically. Um, but basically, self-determination is a wonderful concept that we support. Um, given the history of the different bills, I, I believe that the legislature is really attempting to create a program that's going to be workable and successful. Um, it's not known whether this particular version of, of self-determination will pass in the legislature, but we wanted the board to be aware of it. Yeah, if it doesn't pass by the end of this month, how long is it before it can get put through again? I believe, and maybe Carol can answer, uh, it, it may have the option of going into a two-year bill, which would give it some more time for amendments. They could make that decision in the committee and okay. recommend that it become a two-year bill. Um, if they don't make it out of committee, um, then it does die. But it could be, it could be brought up the next year if someone wanted to pick it up again. They could resubmit it. Okay. I mean, you, you're not too eager to have it ram through the way it is by the end of this month. Right? It, it, it might well, cause problems. Huh? It, it might cause some difficulty, yes. Um, there's some procedural things that need to be worked out and need to be in, in the law so that it gets processed and, and the benefit to the individual gets done correctly <coughs> um, because there are, is not a whole lot of structure um, to the way that it's done today. I would like to answer a public input question, if possible, or at least provide some information. Um, All right. The, uh, there was a question about wanting to have some information about how this bill differs from previous bills. And the Assembly uh, Human Services Committee did a bill analysis, and they provided that information in their analysis, and that can be accessed online. Uh, the, the website is www.legeinfo.ca.gov. And then you can do a search for um, Bill 468 and look up the Assembly Bill Analysis. Thank you. Can you repeat that again one time? The website? Yes. www.legeinfo, L-E-G-I-N-F-O, dot C-A dot gov. Thank you. You're welcome. If this passes this year, next year, um, does that mean that everybody has to do it, or can you like the system you've got? You can stay with it. You can stay with it. And I forgot to mention that the bill would be phased in over a period of three years. It would first serve up to 2,500 individuals, and then um, with the intent that it would go um, be eligible for all regional center consumers who want to participate. <coughs> Um, you said tomorrow it will be heard in the assembly? Yes. All right. Denise always wants you to help me. I would ask that if this does pass through, if you could then come back and tell us exactly what went through or if it did not pass through. Okay. For, for next month, I'd like to know one way or another exactly what happened, if you would do that for us. Okay, sure. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you going through all of this. It really helps. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay. Legislative physics. Thank you. Thank you all for the uh, sheets that were returned last time. And uh, we're working on making sure that when we go speak to legislators that we have your input or you with us or us with you when you go. So we all are, are uh, singing off the same sheet of music. That's a good thing because I don't sing. But. So if there was any other input, any of you who didn't turn in your sheets last time and want to give them to me or uh, send an email to Carol who would forward it on to me if you'd like to go to different Chamber of Commerce meetings or meet with legislators or even local politicians, that would be good too because we're, we're liking, we, we like the idea of them knowing us and us knowing about them too because sometimes there's more interest out there than we would think. So once we start just being open to listening and having them tell us what, what they would like to know about us and hearing about their lives, it's pretty amazing what we can find out. So let me know. Thank you. Anyone else have a paper they'd like to turn in? Or you forgot yours? You could email Carol. Anyone else has uh, an interest in visiting locally? That's where we're going to start, correct, Trevor? We're going to start locally first. Yes. So if anyone else is interested, please make sure that your interest is given to Carol so that we can pair you up. We are going out in two or three. New business, SB 579, Oversight, Efficiency, and Quality Enhancement. Okay. The nice thing about this bill is it's a two-year bill. So <laughs> um, it'll take a little time to get through. However, uh, what this one is talking about has to do with um, placing and, and restructuring possibly the oversight for providers in the community. Right now, providers <coughs> meet with licensing, Department of Rehabilitation possibly, quality assurance from us. Mm -hmm. uh, they could be involved with adult protective services. They could be children's services, etc. So there's a whole a number of monitoring entities that are responsible for <coughs> reviewing our types of, of vendors. And what it, the bill is proposing is that possibly this be brought into regional center, and or there could be an outside organization that would be contracted with to do that function. But it, the goal is to eliminate some of the duplicative um, monitoring processes. So we are watching this really carefully, um, and it looks like it has some promise um, to be able to streamline things and kind of cut through it pretty quick. But um, we're, we're, we are watching this one. And right now, uh, we are in asking um, that you allow us to, to certainly work with with the vendors and to see where people are and what we might be able to do. Um, there is a possibility that we could be asked to be a pilot regional center on this. Um, I won't know that for at least another year or so. Um, but if, um, if we are interested in doing something like this, um, then we would need your approval to step up and step forward to do it. There is a meeting that's being held with the Vendor Advisory Committee and Jim Shorter is going to be coming down and talking with the vendors at that meeting to make sure that they're up to date and that people understand what the intent of the law is. And we will go from there. So. Do you need a motion to uh, I, at this I don't, time? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I just um, let us report back from the uh, enthusiasm of the vendors and what their wishes were. Any questions on this topic? So at this time, we have trustee input. Do any of you have any input or a lot input? <laughs> All right. Yeah, they me and John. Look at a huge school hope and the 
any money at 5 in the morning, 8.30. But afternoon, the staff, our staff at school hope get leave at 3.30, but um, the coin still wait for the bike. The bike still get there at 4 o'clock. After four o'clock, they, they close the door after four o'clock. And, and some clients wait for the bus to get there at 4.15 or 4.30. All right, we're going to have to take a short break. Checking in to it again. Thank you. You're welcome. Keep track of that. You're welcome. Transportation can be very difficult. And I'm sorry that you're having such difficulty. But I'm sure Carol will handle this. Check it into it. Check it into it. Okay. And uh, keep us appraised of what's going on. You have my phone number. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Got you, babe. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else with any comments? Yes. I've been fine. I wasn't here last month. I was just curious. Did all our conflict of interest statements get turned in? Yes. Yes, a couple of us made a mess. So. Yeah. All of our conflict of interest were sent in. Yes. But a few of us one make didn't one. check one box right. But I'm going to fix it. And we have to have that finished. Any of you who received the little, yes, we'll fix that little box. But other than that, we are okay. Our bylaws have a condition. You miss three consecutive meetings. There's no, you know, I was out playing tiddlywinks. I was dying of pneumonia. It says you missed three meetings. Or you miss six meetings, a board member, in a 12-month period, calendar year. Yes. Who's enforcing that? We did receive, last month, we did receive a printout of, I'm <coughs> to progress, which we received an attendance update last week. <coughs> we have at least one board member who meets the criteria. At this we meeting, we do, yes. So, do we proceed with removing them, or what's the policy? What are we doing? I have, it's not personal, it's just we have, have bylaws, and if we don't do it now, we won't be able to do it later. Because if we don't remove Patrick, because he missed his six meetings, and then Peter misses six meetings, and we try to remove him. Mm -hmm. okay. so, yeah. I mean, we've hit the threshold, and we have to make a decision. Well, duly noted, I, correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. I would think this would, you would bring this up in executive, and then make a recommendation to the full board, and uh, we all did receive that time card thing last month. So we know where we stand. So I, I would think it would come from the executive committee as a recommendation to the full board. Does anyone have any contradictions to that? All right, that's how we'll handle it. Can I have one other question? Okay. <laughs> well, there's a letter in here about, we have from Carol, a report on how well we're meeting a caseload ratio. Mm -hmm. Yes. And there's a thing in here about getting people to talk. I was just curious on how we were advertising that. Um, it's being done a number of different ways. It is on the web, on the website, oh, where yeah. people can go on and do that. And then um, letters have gone out <coughs> to some families and you all and case managers, and we're asking the case managers to also provide some input. Anything else? Having reached the end of our agenda, we will uh, recess, the uh, meeting is adjourned at this time. We'll recess and then come back for executive session.